Good morning. How was everyone this morning? Well, it's a great day to be in the Lord's house. I'm happy about the fact that we're able to meet together here this morning. It's going to be a great day in the house. And I'd like to meet, I'd like to greet everyone who's also joining us online, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube or other platforms. And I'd encourage you, if you're on Facebook, you know, share it with, um, share it with your friends and greet those that are uh, watching with you as well. And um, it's a great day to be in the Lord's house. And let's go ahead and start off this morning with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. And God, we thank you that we can be here together. Uh, we pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word this morning. I pray that we would leave here encouraged, God, by you. God, I pray that you would help us in all that we say and do and help us always to look to you. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, at this time, we are going to have a baptism. Yeah, come on down. All right. Come on up here, brother. Man, our church tripled in size based off of uh, one person getting baptized. It is a blessing to see all of you. Good morning. And uh, welcome to all of our guests. You guys are awesome. Uh, if I have someone get baptized every Sunday, can all of you come? All right, well, I'm Pastor Chuck and uh, the associate pastor here. We're on the youth ministry. Cole is my neighbor. This church has heard a lot about Cole. I've been bragging on you a lot. Um, you know, this coronavirus and Cole's two surgeries have brought our families closer together than they've ever been. You know, for, we've lived at uh, Brian Meadows for, I don't know, 18 years now. Uh, but we've seen each other and the family, and it's just been awesome getting to know everybody. Well, Cole gave his heart to Christ in my dining room, and uh, it was amazing. It was awesome. And we started, I said, you know what, you need to be discipled. So we started a discipleship program, and we came up on baptism, a public identifying with Jesus Christ and uh, what he's done for him. Cole said, well, I want to get baptized. And uh, so here we are today. So, brother, do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. If you die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? Yes. All right. You're not perfect, are you? No? Mom, is he perfect? No. She's shaking her head no. But we're working on it. And we're, all of us are working on it. Amen. So, well, brother, that's all that I needed to ask you before we can get you baptized. Is there anything you'd like to share with everybody? No? No, no words of wisdom? No encouragement? Yeah. All right, brother. Come here. Jeez. All right. Hey. Upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised by the power of his resurrection. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> well done. All right. Now we have a uh, special video from Pastor, and uh, we'll share that with you guys. Good morning. It is good to be with you, even if it is only virtually. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm glad you're in church today or watching online. It's great to have you. I am doing very well. I, I really, really appreciate your prayers. My quarantine officially ends after today. Now, the state of Maryland sent me a text yesterday saying my quarantine is over, uh, but the uh, office, the medical office that I've been going through said uh, they want me quarantined until Monday. So this is my last day of quarantine, and uh, I wish I could have been in church today, but they did not release me, so I'm doing what they say. I will be tested again uh, tomorrow, and... I don't quite understand it, but I'm released from quarantine, supposedly, even if I test positive, because there are, uh, it's been long enough. Uh, but pray that it would be negative. That would certainly be a lot better. Um, I do appreciate, again, you praying for me. I have felt good all week long. I've actually gotten quite a bit done this week. I've outlined a couple messages. And I've been uh, watching videos, been in some webinars, have some good things for the church. I don't, don't think we can implement anything probably the rest of this year. Uh, but some good ideas for next year and some things that we'll do come January. 
Uh, so it's been a productive time, some things I've wanted to get to for quite a while that I finally had time to do uh, while I was quarantined. I do uh, ask you to please pray for my wife. On Friday night, she fell in the middle of the night and hurt her arm. I insisted that she go to patient first to have an x-ray because she was in quite a bit of pain. So Michael took her to patient first on Saturday morning and she has a small fracture uh, near her wrist. Uh, so please pray for her. Uh, it's been pretty painful. So she's not, she's not in church this morning because of that. Uh, we weren't sure whether she was supposed to be quarantined or not another day for her. Uh, but with the, with the fracture, she obviously can't be. And we are to follow up with the orthopedist this week. So pray that we would be able to get in there without any problem. It's a little hard getting in to see some doctors. Uh, but the patient first doctor said to follow up with your orthopedic doctor. So we will be doing that. And again, I would appreciate your prayers for her. Uh, thank you. We, we look forward to being back. Lord willing, I'll be with you on Wednesday night and plan to be in church next Sunday. Uh, I know that uh, Pastor Chuck is going to preach well today. You're in good hands. And uh, I am... Uh, Lord willing, I'm watching on home, at home right now. This, is, of course, is recorded the day before. Uh, but I trust that I am watching online. And uh, I'm praying for Pastor Chuck to preach well. Well, God bless you. I look forward, very forward, to seeing you soon. Getting out of this quarantine will be wonderful. And I'll be back. God bless you. Well, isn't it exciting to see someone get baptized? That's awesome. You know, we... Uh... In the Bible, it talks about if you know Christ as your Savior, you follow him in believer's baptism. That's awesome. I do have a little update from pastor's video message that was recorded a couple days ago. He wanted the church to know that his wife's arm, Terry's arm, may not be broken. It may just be a, a bad sprain. Uh, they'll go to orthopedic tomorrow and uh, find out if it is or if it's not. So just pray for the Lord. Uh, to work there. I know she's in a uh, tremendous amount of pain, so be praying for that. Well, now we have some special music by Anisha. darkness, the source of light and truth and grace. I know the fount of all forgiveness, who pours a life through saving
trust him and serve him. The one who first loves me. Well, to all of our guests, Apologize that you have to wear a mask. I know it's not comfortable in this day and age. Uh, if you want, you could come up here and preach, and I could come down and sit and wear the mask. And uh, uh, I know people don't exactly uh, uh, like public speaking. Most people don't. But one of the perks is you don't have to wear a mask. So praise the Lord for that. Well, it is excellent uh, to have all of you here today. Um, I wish it was more. I know we have a ton of people online. I want to welcome all of you that are watching online. There's people that can't come because of lots of different reasons. Uh, uh, you know, with the coronavirus and things like that, people just want to be careful and things. Um, but it's just great to have you all here publicly. Uh, physically that I can see and those online um, just know that we miss you I hope Anisha watched herself sing that was a beautiful song wasn't it she did a great job I know it's weird watching yourself on uh, on the screen when I watched I, I pre-recorded a Wednesday night message and then my family sat down in my family room to watch me preach and I was looking at their faces wondering do they like this message or do they hate it you know it was just this awkward feeling to see yourself up on that screen like that um, but I do love technology. It was neat to see Patty. Uh, where are you at, Patty? Um, to see she, her picture was on there here, 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 and here. She did all four parts of a song at the same time. It was like she was, uh, she was multiplied. So that was really, really cool. All right. Well, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 25 of Romans chapter 7. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry about it. We'll have the verses up on the screen. But if you're able to, let's stand out of the read, uh, respect for the reading of God's Word from Romans 7, verses 14 through 25. If you're able to stand, stand with us. If not, it's no problem at all. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and he is conflicted. Uh, most of us know the Apostle Paul was a awesome, dynamic Christian. He was a... A, just a, a, a zealot uh, for God. And, but he's got this conflict, and it's a conflict that I think all of us believers have, and I'm going to be talking about it today. So let's, let's read about him and his, this internal struggle that he's having. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. That word carnal means fleshy. I'm made of flesh, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not, for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Not then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. You ever get that way? I know what's right. I'm a pastor. I read the Bible all, every day. I still struggle. We'll keep going. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Verse 20. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity. I circled that word captivity. I'm being captured by my flesh. To the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Then it gets a little bit happy at the end. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Let's pray. Father, I love you and praise you. I thank you for this time. I do pray that you would just bless this message. Speak through me. Use me to touch every soul in this room, myself included. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The message title I have today is 
holy, holy, holy. Christians should live by biblical principles, not feelings. Our feelings get us in trouble. Raise your hand if you've made a mistake by trusting your feelings. Uh, we bought my little daughter Hannah from Disney, a, um, uh, or she got a shirt from a relative, and it's a cute little princess shirt, but it says, follow your feelings. And we thought, oh, it's great, great. And I'm like, wait a minute. The Bible teaches against following your feelings. Like your parents say um, to some of you young people, I don't think that spouse is, or that young lady or that young man is someone you should hang out with. And you're like, I know them. We're good friends. And your parents are like, no, 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 no. You're a different person around them. I know. And we're like, trust your feelings. This world, the society that we live in says, trust your feelings. Christians need to live by biblical principles and not feelings. Lester Roloff, an old-time preacher, one of them fire and brimstone preachers, said, we need to get ourselves some convictions instead of opinions. Uh, go on social media today. Is there an overabundance of opinions out there? And many of them differ from yours. So whose opinion is right? Who do we trust? Well, I can tell you this. If you trust in the opinions found in this book you're going to be on strong, stable ground versus the sinking sand of our own choices. I always tell this to our young people, and I've said it many times preaching. Feelings change, but biblical principles never do. And here's a good example. Um, my daughter Abigail and I were taking this 15-passenger uh, rental van back up to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We had to get a van, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We had a rental van. We brought it home, but we had to take it back the next day, two-and-a-half-hour trip. Now, the problem is, is the bus, the minibus that, praise the Lord, is all fixed. Yay! Need a new radiator because it blew up uh, on our trip uh, on Thursday, which was horrible. So we went ahead, and we had the minibus towed here, and the rental company is there. So I dropped the bus off. I got towed and we dropped the bus off. And I'm like, how do I get here? I called Enterprise. They'll pick you up. That's their slogan. Now, Corona, this and that. We're lazy. We don't want to come get you. Whatever the reason is. So some man took me by God's grace. I'm like, I need a ride. This guy said, do you need a ride? I'm like, yes. I got in a stranger's car and we went five miles, about 10 minute drive to Enterprise. Got the van. Now, now i got to take the van back, but that leaves me here with my daughter and the minibus here. I'm like, what do I do? So I told Abby, we got to get an Uber or we got to get a ride. I, don't, I, I didn't mind me getting a ride, but me and my 16-year-old daughter, that's a little bit different story there. So I'm not throwing her in some crazy person's car, right? So I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I said, okay, Uber or We'll get a ride. No, I don't want to do that. Uber, well, I'm cheap. I don't want to spend the money. What do I do? And I said, Abigail, don't you have your learners? She says, yeah. I'm like, ding. I got a great idea. It's only five miles from the repair shop to the rental place. Should a 16-year-old drive a 15-passenger van? No, no. There's big problems with that. But I said, you know, it's only five miles. And if she was behind me, then I wouldn't have to get an Uber. Then I wouldn't have to worry about this. All my problems are solved, except it's wrong. No matter what my feelings are, it's wrong. And she looked at me and she's like, I'll do whatever you say, but I don't feel. And I'm like, you know what, Abby? You're a good, good daughter. That is wrong. We're not going to do it. We are going to pray that the Lord gives us a ride via Uber or a ride or whatever. And so she's like, great. I could see the relief come down in her. And I'm like, okay, good. So I called Enterprise and I said, well, here's my dilemma. I'm picking up this uh, minibus and I got your thing. And they said, where is it located? I said, it's at this, uh, this company. He, they said, oh, we pick up from them all the time. And I thought, how about that? So we took the van there. We dropped it off, put the keys inside. They came and got it and we didn't have to break the law we didn't trust in our feelings which were like hey let's just s solve this problem some way we 
followed the principles of doing right versus doing wrong, and then God opened and blessed that door um, that we went through. Well, the Bible says, holy, holy, holy. It's mentioned um, three or two times in the Bible. Uh, you'll see that expression, holy, holy, holy. And it talks about the Lord of, uh, the Lord of hosts and the Lord God Almighty. It also refers to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. Now, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7, I'll read you the verse. It says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. So in Leviticus, the Old Testament, the Bible's saying, Sanctify yourself and be holy, because I'm your God. Do you guys know that God wants humanity to be holy? God wants us to be righteous. It says here in 1 Peter 15, or 115, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Um, Cole, we talked about this. Before I got saved, and even right after I got saved, I had a terrible mouth. And the Holy Spirit, one of the first things that he worked on in my life was cleaning up the way that I spoke. A Christian ought not to say blank. A Christian ought not to do blank. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And then in 1 Peter 1, 16, it says, Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Easier said than done, isn't it? I, I struggle with lust. Beautiful woman walks by. It's hard for me not to look. But the Bible says don't lust. That's a daily battle for me. Some people struggle with food. Some people, people uh, struggle with other types of addictions in their lives. It's easy to say, I'm going to be holy, but it's hard to do. Any of you drive the speed limit? No hands. Oh, one person, one saint. Yeah, <laughs> one saint. We could say, I am holy, but I break the law every day in many, many different, different ways. So God has called us to be different than the world that we live in. And it is hard to do. Um, what's one reason or one of the first reasons you hear about people not wanting to come to church? The church is full of hypocrites. Of course, we, of course it is. I just said we're supposed to be holy, but all of us break the speed limit. All of us lie from time to time. All of us uh, commit certain types of sins and things like that. So we're all hypocrites, yes. But we should be striving for holiness. In Matthew 5, 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Cole, you did a great thing today. You got baptized. You're letting your light, Jesus Christ, uh, saved you, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you, and now you're a beacon, a lighthouse, just like every Christian is supposed to be. And uh, what happens, uh, uh, John and Stacy? we live out in the country, and we have our bright front porch lights, and we have bugs all over our front porch all the time. They're attracted to that light, and that's what Christianity should be. Sadly, Christianity is just as messed up as the world. The divorce rate inside the church is a little bit higher than the divorce rate outside the church. Why? If I'm saved and Teresa's saved, we should be able to work things out and have a great Christian home and marriage. Sadly, it's not happening. Why? Somewhere along the line, holiness has been missed. Selfishness has taken over. And we have problems. Would any of you agree with me that this world is an absolute train wreck? The world that we live in is a mess? When you turn on the news, do you see 90% positive and 10% negative or the vice versa? Obviously, we see the worst. I know there's good out there. There's lots of good out there, but there's lots and lots of bad too. The sad thing is, is that some of us in here, myself included, and when I point to all of you, I've got three fingers pointing right back at me, and this message just hit me between the eyes this week, and I want to share exactly why. So, I told you the bus broke down. I'm the leader of this trip going up to Lancaster, Pennsylvania with 25 people to see 
Esther. It's a beautiful play. Everybody's invested $60 a person to go to this play. And so I had my dear brother. Everybody look over at this man right here standing up. Jay. Yes, we love you, Jay. All right, Jay worked on our bus. We got, I, well, he recommended I get new tires, so I got new tires. He put a new pulley on it, new brakes on it, new calipers, did a once-over, took care of some other things. He just got this thing ready. So I'm thinking, my bus is ready. I got my money ready. I got my directions ready. I got my plan ready. I got everything ready except for a blown radiator. Why didn't I fix the radiator before we left? Because I didn't know it was broken. <laughs> it blew up. Stinking radiator. You know what the guy told me at the repair place? He said, the top of your radiator and the bottom is made of hard plastic. Stinking plastic. Should be metal. And over time, it's sitting is not very good. Our bus doesn't run that much. But sitting for a long period of time, that, met, that plastic, it's a little brittle, and it just cracked. And our radiator blew, we overheated, and we had to do what we had to do. So now I'm stuck on the side of the road with hundreds of cars driving by me at a high rate of speed. It's very scary. Is one of them going to careen off the road and smash into the back of the bus and kill everybody? I don't know. It was crossed my mind. That's stressful. Pastor Prey, tow truck maybe, repair place, I, I don't know, and... What are we going to do, Pastor Jack? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Shut up! You know, I'm telling everybody, be quiet. Right? I'm trying to be calm and cool under pressure. Oh, God's got this. All we need to do is just pray. It doesn't exactly work like that in the heat of the moment. I got uh, Dave Metcalf pulled up in front of me. He opens up the back of the car. And I got Sherry and I think Stacy taking pictures of me going. I'm like, stop taking pictures of me! We were actually having a good time with that. We, Dave goes to Walmart, gets water, antifreeze. Maybe it's a small lake. God is so good to us. We'll probably just keep it filled up with water. And then we will be able to get to Sight and, well, get to Chick-fil-A first, then Sight and Sound, and then a uh, restaurant on the way home, and then all the way home. And I'll get it fixed in my leisurely time because of the coronavirus. I have many days that I can do this. No. We pour it in, and it pours right back out because it's not a little hole. It's a big one. We drive the van for about two miles. Beep, 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 beep. You're going to blow the engine up, and then all the finance committee is going to kill you, right? That kind of stuff. Pull over. I go over, and we find this huge gas station type place, and praise the Lord, we were able to Get out of the bus. We're safe. We're off the highway. Um, I called a company to fix it. I called several companies. Finally, one answered. And they had a tow truck company, and they came. And what we did is we took uh, T. Smith and Carla were in their vehicle, and Dave and his family uh, and Stacy and Danielle were in their car. They came and got everyone and shuttled them to, like, Chick-fil-A and then shuttled them to Sight and Sound. And everyone got to see the production except for me. And yes, I'm bitter. <laughs> now, when everyone saw me when they came out of the production, Pastor Chuck, they all feel so much. Oh, you had to, you had to stay behind and you missed it. Oh, and I'm like, oh, hey, God was so good. You know, all these things, right? We get home. And guess what? The next day, I got to spend seven hours driving back up and come back. And hope that it's fixed and hope that it's right. But before uh, the van wasn't ready, I went to the vet. And the vet said, hey, guess what? Um, your dog uh, tore her ACL. Oh, so what type of topical ointment could I put on that? <laughs> uh, they said the $4,500 kind called surgery. Now, those of you that know me, know that I love this dog. I don't know why I love this dog so much. I don't think I can do this surgery. So we're going to try to go another route. But So that was discouraging. So I'm coming home from the vet thinking, oh, you don't love your dog? She's not worth it? Is she a part of your family? Who's going to judge me for not having this surgery? Well, I can't. They're going to break her, they're gonna break her, her, her joint, plate it, 
cast it, and I got to put her in a crate. I don't even have a crate. A crate for six weeks. Carry her out to the bathroom and then put her back in a prison cell for six weeks. I'm like, how is that possible? She's a 100-pound dog. I just can't see it. So, at this point in my life, God's not my favorite person. This is where trouble starts. And this is where this message comes from. The Bible says if you faint in the day of adversity, your faith is weak. Now, I, I believe I had strong faith the day that the, the bus broke down. But when you add it all together, now I've got to drive back up. Now it's all said and done. I'm just kind of mad. I'm a little frustrated. I'm a little frustrated with God. And I told Teresa before I left to go to the vet. And then, yeah, I was feeling this way afterwards. I said, pray for me. If I have the chance to sin today, I will. Because I want to. I don't want to be good. I don't want to be Pastor Chuck. You know what I want to be? I want to be ticked off. I want to be upset. I certainly don't want to be holy and righteous. Somebody just knock this off my shoulder this little straw off my shoulder and see what happens today. You ever been that way? My wife had the great idea. She said, why don't you take Abby with you? It was such a good idea. We had a great day, a sweet time, and then the Lord worked how he worked, and we went to Lone, Longhorn, and we got steaks and dessert. We had a good trip up, a good trip back. Uh, I called my two accountability partners and I said, pray for me because, and this was before things were going well, I'm in a bad place right now. You know, I'm a pastor. You guys may think, uh, well, those of you that know me closely know that uh, <laughs> I certainly am no different than you. But being up here, it, it, it elevates you. It almost makes you like you're perfect or better than everybody well guys I'm just gonna shoot straight with you I'm not I'm not I'm full of just a whole bunch of crud and um, I like to feel that I've matured and I'm above these things and and the Bible says that as the as the dog goes back to its vomit it, you, a dog you, it throws up but then it goes back and eats it it says sinners do that we 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 get something out and then we go right back to it you ever uh, uh, in college we had some friends that uh, they were dating this guy this girl was dating this guy and he was a he was a jerk to her and then they would break up and then she'd go right back to him we're like why are you going back to him he treats you like garbage it's just like that's what we do sometimes. So God says, I want you to be holy. I want you to be righteous. Holy, holy means this, set apart to the service or worship of God. A holy vessel. Righteous means doing what is right, just, holy, free from wrong, guilt, or sin. Can you say today that you are holy and you, you are righteous? I would say to you that I am not. I can be very holy and very righteous. And throughout the day I am at times. And then there's times when I am not. So why aren't so many of us holy and righteous? The answer is very simple. We love the world more than we love God. Now, that is a strong statement. And some of you may be offended by it. But the truth is this. We love the world. We love good food. Do, do, do we like uh, dessert more than we like vegetables? I know I do. Do we love laying around on the couch doing nothing or studying the Bible? I like just Sunday afternoon, football, golf, nap time. I don't want to study. I don't want to read. I want to be lazy and do nothing. Do you want to come up to the church and cut the grass? Where's is Michael? He's over there. Michael put out a plea yesterday on Facebook. Is anybody coming to cut the grass with me? We rode 20 miles yesterday. And he said, it's, it's raining. He says, I'm going to go up to the church and cut the grass. I'm like, it's raining. He's like, well, it needs to be done. I at least want to make it look good around the uh, doorways and things like that. I'm like, I didn't want to do anything after I rode 20 miles. I wanted to sit on my tushy. 
The Bible says in 1 John 2, 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This world is temporary. This world has things that are set up to trap us, to grab us, to distract us from Jesus. And we get ourselves into trouble. And when we wrap ourselves around this world, it's very difficult to be holy. It's very difficult to be righteous when we are surrounded and wrapped up in this world that we live in. Why does God tell us not to love this world? We end up pushing God to the curb when we get involved with things in the world. Now, here's a good example. If I take my cell phone, take it downstairs with me to do my devotions, I'm going to check eBay, sports, uh, some you know, sports page. I'm going to check Facebook. I'm going to check something I ordered on Amazon. And then I'm going to get into my Bible reading, prayer, quiet time, that kind of stuff like that. Sometimes my wife will come down an hour later and I go, put the phone up, open up the Bible. She's like, what you been doing? I'm like, oh, you know, studying the Bible, reading. You ever done that? You ever, ever stayed up too late watching a sporting event or a movie and then you couldn't get up early to do devotions? Or maybe you were out too late on a Saturday night and you couldn't come to church on Sunday because you were too tired. The world that we're talking about grabs you. And it just does this. It separates you from God. We will fall in love with this world. It's an acquired taste. We will fall in love with it. I have a uh, uh, family, uh, some family uh, members, and uh, they had uh, significant health problems. And that was part of them coming to church and, and professing Christ as their Savior. 10, 12 weeks straight went to church. Then all of a sudden... Uh, people get well. Baseball season happens. Twelve weeks straight, they went to church. Now they're too busy. On the boat. Tournaments. Now, I'm not saying you have to come to church every Sunday, but I'm saying the love of this world can pay, keep you away from church. And it does it to me. It can do it to you. Remember, one finger to you, but three coming right back at me. Lester Roloff said in this message from 1969, and spoke to my heart and helped me get out of my little funk that I was in. We need a spiritual refreshing. You can't soak your soul in a bunch of garbage and expect God to give you fire. Now, in his illustration, he said, a bunch of you men wake up, and the first thing you do is go out and get the Sunday morning paper. Guess what? Facebook, ESPN, is your Sunday morning paper. Well, guess I got to get dressed and go to church now. And God's saying, hey, I wanted you to read my word. I wanted you to spend time with me. I wanted you to pray with me, but you didn't have time for me because you were too wrapped up in your newspaper. Your media, your music, your, your, your hobbies. He also said, now this is a fire and brimstone preacher. He said, it's not the weekend, it's the wicked end. Now, that's hard for some of you to understand, but when I was saved, I had a fire and brimstone preacher that, uh, that, that preached, and he was against everything. But I loved it. I, I maybe because I was a wrestler and a, a football player and a baseball player, and my coaches and my father, they all screamed at me to, to, to do better and do things like that. I loved it. So he'd say, Don't you touch that alcohol. That alcohol is the juice of the devil. Don't you touch those cigarettes, they'll give you cancer. Don't you do this and come to church and do that. I was like, Amen. I liked it. Some of you are like, I don't like that. Nineteen sixty nine, everything that this man was preaching is 
very true today. We need to get away from this world. What was your week like? How many days did you wake up and do devotions? How many days did you wake up and pray to God for more than 30 seconds? How many verses did you work on this week? The cool thing with our youth program, we have a verse pack that we work on. And uh, each year we, we, we memorize verses. At the end of the year we have a scripture memory exam. And it, it forces me to memorize scripture. It, it's really helpful. But how many did you memorize this week to help you fight sin? The Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Memorizing scripture helps you sin less. Helps you be righteous, holy. Did you go to church Wednesday night? We have a prayer meeting here Wednesday night. Youth group, uh, kids programs. What type of music did we listen to? Uh, Abby and I were coming back from the uh, trip and our van, our minibus doesn't get very good reception. So I was scanning through the radio. I got tired and I was getting a little drowsy and she was uh, watching a video or something. So I flipped it on and guess what? I got into some go-go music. I got into some old rock and roll. I got into some other stuff. And I'm like, la, 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 la. And I'm like, wait a minute. What's the lyrics? What are you listening to? If it's saying, I'm getting drunk on a plane. If it's saying, I'm going to do this with her or him. It's sin. It's unrighteous. It's not holy. And it's influencing you. So when your bad day comes, you act in the flesh instead of in the spirit. The Bible says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh says, be angry. Knock somebody out. Curse at somebody. Be offended. The spirit says, don't do those things. Fill yourself up. Paul was having trouble with this. At the beginning of the verses I read, he's like, look, the, the, I know what's good. I know what's right, but it, sometimes it's hard to do it. But I can tell you this, if we're walking over here with the Lord and we're striving to be righteous and holy instead of over here in the world in the muck and the mire, we're going to have a better time or an easier time being holy and righteous. So how was your week? In your phone on your phone, if you go to settings, screen time, you can see how much time you spent using your phone this week. I was in Myrtle Beach uh, last week, and my screen time was three hours a day. Um, it's normally eight, eight hours of screen time. Now, I would say that that may be average, uh, maybe more for some of you, maybe a lot less, I will tell you with our young people, it's way less. Mine is way less than theirs. I have three young people in my house, and I know their screen time is way higher than mine. It has been, it can be. So what am I putting into my soul? What am I soaking in? Well, I love watching funny stone videos, but every now and then there's a girl with a thong bikini on. Well, that's not appropriate. What do you, what do you think about when you see that? Maybe there's a video that's really funny, but they're playing a very worldly song that makes us to think about some things we ought not to think about. Then we let that slip in. Maybe it's a really funny video, but they only use the F word one time. Do you guys see what I'm getting at? So eight hours a day, I'm thumbing through. Is it helping me get closer to God? Is it helping me be spiritual, holy, righteousness? Or is it helping me fall more in love with the world? We know the answer. We fall in love with the world more. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion, that's harmony, that's agreement, Half light with darkness, and what concord, I mean, that's agreement and harmony, hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, 
As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. God is telling us, oh, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and shall be, or ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. God's saying, look, just separate yourselves from the world, and I can use you. I can work with you. My wife and I have had discussions. We have seen, if we allow, say, my youngest to play Roblox for hours and hours and hours, um... We had some dinner guests over, so she played for a couple hours. Then afterwards, she was very rebellious. She was very attitude-y. And you know what? I've seen that same attitude in myself when I've been watching videos for hours and hours and hours. I certainly feel lazy spending three, four hours watching videos. Sometimes staying up too late to all hours in the evening and not being able to get up the next morning because of how I spent my time that evening. We need to get, the, get it together, guys. 1 John 4, 4 says this, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you that is in the world. We should have overcome, or we should overcome this world we should not be addicted to things. We should have self-control. Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Proverbs 24, 16. For the just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Listen. God designed us for success. He gave us the Holy Spirit to reside inside of our hearts. We should have victory over smoking. We should have victory over temptations, over sin in our lives. If that show is inappropriate, turn it off. If that video is worldly, turn it off. If that literature you're reading is wrong, get rid of it. Because God says, be holy for I am holy. And when you're holy, you're righteous. And when you're righteous, you can fight temptation and you can act more of, of a Christ, like a Christian and you can be a light in the darkness. And that's what God wants. Stacy, do you guys ever have barn swallows in your front porch make nest? One year, we had barn swallows. Two years, they came back. And they made these nests. And on the top of my pillars, there was a ledge, and they put their nest there. And I thought, that's cool, because they had babies, and it was really cool. But the problem is, they're one of the dirtiest birds that there are. And those jokers pooped all over my concrete. I said, no problem, got my pressure washer. It's 10,000 PSI. It can blow the concrete off almost. I'm like, eh, eh, eh. I hate barn swallows. My concrete is stained. Because of whatever it is that they eat, it don't come off of concrete. I heard a preacher say on the way home, I couldn't find any good music, so I found a, a, a preacher preaching. And he said this, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. Guys, we are gonna be, we're going to have sinful thoughts. Somebody walks in, you don't like that person, I hate them. <laughs> and you wouldn't say it, but maybe you thought it. Oh my goodness, that is the ugliest haircut I've ever seen. You know, I don't know, whatever pops into your brain. Lots of bad things pop into this brain because it's full of junk. And the preacher was saying, look, you can't keep those thoughts from coming. But you can keep yourself from dwelling on them and letting them fester. And then next thing you know, you're impacted by them. So that thought, that inappropriate thought bumps into your mind or heart or whatever, just bounce it right out. Don't allow it to stay. If the barn swallows come back, I attack them. I'll sit out there and I'll have a BB gun, I'll have a sprayer, I'll have everything. I'm like, not this year. Go somewhere. Go to John and Stacy's. <laughs> Don't come to my house. And they're like, man, what's his problem? <laughs> you know? Don't let them nest. Martin Luther was a part of the Great Reformation. He... And I found this out, and this is encouraging to me because it is something I struggle with from my past. 
uh, my father had pornographic videos, and I watched a lot of them. So I struggle with lust all the time. It is something I battle, and I have battled my entire Christian life. I'll probably battle it till the day that I, I die. It's always a temptation that I want to see something, look at something, and I shouldn't. Um, Martin Luther struggled greatly with lust. And he was so upset that he couldn't get to a spiritual place where he didn't. Now, it kept him humble, and it kept him close to God. It kept him on his knees. And maybe that's where God wants us. But with him, it's going to be better than without. And not saturating your soul with the world is going to be better than without. And you, you got to remember that. And so this preacher from 1969 says to all of the people that he's speaking to, do a 30-day trial. Replace your phone, he said, newspaper, with the Bible. I'm going to say, replace your, your phone, your media, some of your hobbies, some of your time wasteful, uh, wasters, anything that's sinful with God's word. And see what God does with you. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit thy works unto God, or the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. We were designed to be victorious in lights. And if we walk with God, we will be. But if we walk in the world, we're going to be lukewarm or cold and ineffective for God. Cole, I've told you it's hard. I got saved when I was your age, 18, 17, 18 years of age. I was popular at school. I played sports. I was a homecoming king. I had friends everywhere in every type of group. And I didn't want them to know that I was a Christian. There was a guy that in, our, in our school carried his Bible to church. I thought, that guy is nuts. I would never do that. Now I think he had it right. He wanted to be a light. He didn't get invited to the parties. I wanted to get invited to the parties. He had it right. And because of that, he probably had a lot less issues and struggles than I've had in my life. Let's overcome our strongholds, our addictions, our sins, and live a victorious life in Jesus Christ. So that's the message. But I have one more thing I want to share with all of you. And to all of my guests, I'm so thankful that all of you came. And, and I certainly didn't want to offend any of you today. And, and the, the whole church here, I want everyone to ask themselves this question. If you died today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? Now listen. Too many of us don't think seriously enough about this question. I don't want you to say, well, I think, I hope, I try to be good. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved by faith, and that it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could work and be a good, holy, righteous person and earn your way into heaven, why did Jesus come? The answer is Jesus came because we could not be good. We have a hard enough time being good even when we are saved and have the Holy Spirit residing in us. There's a lot of people that say, well, I'm an American, so I'm a Christian. There's a lot of people that think, well, I went to church. I got baptized. I, I, I did this, so I'm saved. I'm born again. Ask yourself this question. Do you truly know God? When I was in my funk and I was being upset with the Lord, he was talking to me. Does he talk to you? Now, he didn't say, stop it, idiot. But he was talking to me. He was reaching out to me. I heard this, this message by Lester Roloff. My, uh, he prompted my wife to invite my daughter to come with me. There were lots of little things happening that God was orchestrating to help me get out of this, this place that I was in, that I put myself in. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Now, I am not going to try to embarrass any of you, but make sure you know. 
And I'm telling you what, I'm going to have this Bible after church is over. If anyone doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, if anyone is curious, if anyone has questions, I want you to come see me. And I can take the Bible and show you what it says about salvation. It says this, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Most people know that, but they don't know God personally. One time in your life, you would have had to made him your Lord by inviting him to be your Savior, to ask him to come into your heart and life, forgive you of your sins, believe that he rose again on the third day, and you can be saved. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God makes it easy, religion, and man makes it difficult. All we need to do is place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I can show you how to do that if you don't know. I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, Rosie, could we have an invitation? Would you play for us? Rosie's going to play the piano. The altar is open. I'm just going to uh, have her play a few verses. Why don't we all stand? If you would like, if you have questions about salvation, or if you would like to come down and pray at the altar, maybe you just want to say, God, I want to put away some things in my life that, aren't, that shouldn't be there, and I want to walk closer with you. You can come see me, or you can just come to the altar and pray. It's wide open. Go ahead and play, Rosie. We'll just do a couple verses, just a quick invitation, then we'll close. You can see me now. You can see me afterwards. You can come pray. The altar is open. Spend some time praying right now with God. Say, God, what shouldn't be there? What's keeping me from righteousness and holiness? I want what Pastor Chuck's talking about, this salvation, this holiness given to us by God. The altar is open for prayer. You can pray there at your seat. I know it's in, sometimes a little scary to come forward, but if you want to, you come see me. Say, I want to know more about the salvation. Well, we're going to close in prayer. Just want to, again, Cole, thank you for getting baptized. Family, friends, it's awesome that all of you came to support this brother. Uh, that's, that's really, really cool. Uh, one of our biggest crowds for a baptism, man, so that's awesome. Well done, well done. All right, well, God bless all of you. We have Sunday school at various times today. Uh, get in a Sunday school class, and, of course, Wednesday night church. We're online or we're here. Um, we'd love to have you be a part of all those things. Be praying for Pastor and his wife. And uh, we have a, oh, our offering, it will be in the back there. Not for our guests, but for our members there. If you want to put your offering in the plates, they'll be at the back doors. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this good day that you gave us. Lord, I do pray for this message that would speak to all of our hearts. Lord, speak to me. Help me to purify and work on things that don't need to be there, that shouldn't be there that are keeping me from achieving everything it is that you'd have me to achieve in life, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless.